Well, good afternoon. I'm Sing Aishu, and welcome to the Conscious Listening Festival. This is classical music exploration, and it's part of my cafe series that we usually do uh, online. So it's awesome to do it through New York Adventure Club today. Thank you very much, New York Adventure Club, and also Sudatri and James at Clavier House for hosting this event. Hello to everyone on live stream, and uh, look forward to sharing with you today how the ideas of this piece comes to the composer and then gets translated into a piece of paper, and then uh, that comes into our hands and we create music and recreate the sound, and then how that goes through the instruments and to your ears. So that whole process, and we're gonna do this by starting and ending with a performance. And in the middle, we will be talking, uh, Masumi and I will be talking about the rehearsal process, and then Dan Kellogg, the composer, is gonna talk about the inspiration behind the piece, and Sujachi Reisinger, who rebuilt this amazing piano, is gonna talk about how to make uh, an instrument uh, more expressive. So um, after each section, you will have a chance to uh, ask questions, and we'll turn on the house lights, and um, feel free to think up some interesting things that you wanna discuss with us today. So, uh, to start with, I just want to say that conscious listening is at the core a posture of curiosity, being interested and wondering about how things are, the way they are, why they are that way, and at the broadest reach, it's the mindful moment along with our past experience and also the imagination for future possibilities. And there is a four-step process that we usually go through, and you're welcome to try that out, which is one, to describe it with a word or something to capture what it is you're hearing. Second is to focus on one element. It could be the emotion, it could be the harmony. The third step is to respond personally with what is meaningful for you. And the fourth step is to breathe and digest what you are hearing. So um, I hope that when you leave here that you'll take these listening skills and be able to um, apply them to whatever it is you're doing uh, and find more connection and more possibilities. So um, please visit our website for the bios of our amazing guests. And here we have Masumi Rastad. Yay. <laughs> And uh, as you may know from last night, if you were here, uh, Masumi is a touring uh, chamber musician and professor at Eastman. Um, so this piece was written by Dan Kellogg, who is sitting right there. Um, and uh, last night, I guess, we gave the, the New York premiere of this, uh, of this work. Um, it is, I, the original story of Galatea is, um, uh, inspired, uh, it's, well, Galatea was a, an ivory alabaster statue that was carved by uh, Pygmalion, uh, who, that, that was the sculptor. Um, he so fell in love with his own creation that he, I guess he begged Aphrodite to make her come to life, and so Galatea came to life, his own statue. Um, but then Dan told me yesterday that this is actually based on another sculpture called Galatea that was inspired by the original Galatea. So it's, I, which I thought was really kind of cool. It's kind of like, like a mirror looking in on itself and kind of reflecting back and kind of cycling. So, um, but this is Galatea.
Hi, Masuli. What was going on in your head when you were playing that? <laughs> what was going on in my head? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> a lot of things. <laughs> uh, that you're willing to share with us. <laughs> um, let's see, I think I was feeling the double espresso in my head. <laughs> so it was like, oh yeah, okay. Because um, there are these very long bow strokes that are, uh, you know, you, you really have to kind of slowly draw them out and um, I think a lot of the movement in this is, I, I guess I would call it celestial in a way, like a lot of just expansive um, across bar lines. Mm -hmm. um, so somehow trying to achieve that I was going through my head trying to get past, uh, yeah, it, you, you were talking about hypermeasures mm -hmm. uh, in the rehearsal, but yeah, it's, it's something akin to that of, of trying to, to float past the page. Translation, that's just a grouping together a block of measures into one unit so we get longer lengths of time and how we're organizing time or trying to be outside of time, trying to transcend time maybe? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, uh, Dan can probably talk more about this, but we have a, right, the organizing principles of, of like a 5-4 bar, 6-4 bars, whatever they are, and, and these are ways for us to, to kind of organize ourselves and make sure that we stay together and that we, we establish some kind of a, a common structure, but so much of the music is totally independent of that in general, but um, in this case, it's definitely so. I mean, a lot of the, you wouldn't necessarily be able to notate this it, just by listening to it. You wouldn't understand, I think, that it is a 6-4 or a 5-4. But um, for us, we're kind of thinking these ways. And then you have a very long note value, but it might come in on the fourth sixteenth of the fourth beat. And it's just there, right? So. Do you ever uh, sketch on those uh, graph papers that are like, uh, what is it? You know, for who is a mathematician here? You have those grids, and then when you draw a picture, you have an idea of how to proportion things, and then you can actually count how many boxes there are, so you have an idea. You're looking at me like all funny, you know? Did you ever, you didn't do that? Okay, I like to sketch. Uh, <laughs> um, well, well we, we each have our own process, right? Yeah. Like, like our working process yes. and our, our way to gain access into understanding, right? Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you're visual. I am so visual, yes. My score is a mess. You guys are welcome to look at how messy my score is. It's, no, it's really messy. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know how you actually read that. <laughs> and, and you don't like to mark things. You like to just maintain it and keep it clean. Yeah, I, I, I try, I actually, um, I tell my students to have, to make five copies of everything they're working on. Um, this is like my new process. So the first pass through, like, so you leave the original clean. You never touch the original. So the first pass through is like brain dump. And, and so you just put everything that just spills out of your, like just to be able to function, like, you know, this fingering, this bowing, count, count, you know, like these like directives. Um, don't, you know, don't, you know focus. <laughs> um, and then, you know, circle this. And, the, and then you go after like maybe a week or two, or depending on what your, your learning process timeline is, then you advance to the second copy and you only take the essentials from the first to the second, and then, you know. But I, I don't memorize very well, so I, I need like clean you know, information on the page, because I'm, I'm actually kind of reading in real time. So but I think you, you kind of memorize too. it. You but I think you memorize your part, kind of. Well, I know certain things, because yeah. I'm trying to look at your part. So I'm trying to follow his lines as I'm playing, so I can figure out how to follow him. And like a lot of this piece, I feel like I'm just, I'm chasing you around, <laughs> trying to ignore all the, the measures and just follow your line. Yeah, so, but you know, I, I think that the idea of playing without music, if that started with Franz Liszt, it's all his fault. But um, I don't know that it is necessary in order to not have the music to feel organic. Cause like that was so organic. Um, and I think it's, a, it's like two separate issues. 
Yeah. Well, I, I'm lucky because I play viola, so I, I don't have to memorize stuff. <laughs> Pianists, <laughs> like, there's like this expectation, I think, on pianists, like, you yeah. must, if you don't memorize, you're not serious. Oh, and, right, like, right. And, then, and then I think when I turned 40, I was like, you know, I, I, can, uh, I can never play from memory again because I have the age excuse. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, some of my favorite musicians don't memorize. But I was going to say, uh, I was going to say like five different things. Let me choose what order to go in. Um, the last note is my favorite note. Like, because your bow control is like, is so amazing. Espresso. Uh, no, I, I, don't, I didn't hear that. I heard more like calm magnesium drink <laughs> so calm um, magnesium, all right. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's it's a good flavor um but i was gonna say one of one of my listeners i don't know if you're listening um had this phrase she was saying one of the things for conscious listening that she does is to put all her consciousness into one sound and for me, I felt like that was happening with the very last note. And it was um, kind of bringing in all the noise and, and whatever into like a very, very small space, mm -hmm. um, contained space. And so that was my favorite moment. Did you have a favorite moment? Um. Might have been one of the high fifths that I think I actually got this time. <laughs> <laughs> there are these it's very so high exposed so fifths, um, and fifths and viola players don't love fifths, but um, I mean, open fifths are great. But <laughs> well, tuning tuning on viola is much harder, right? Because you have to like be so specific with your. You, you can't really. This is like a setup for a viola joke, right? <laughs> I feel like I'm walking into it. <laughs> I don't tell jokes. I could never, I, I never learned how to tell jokes now. So you're safe. You're Wait, safe. What, you said tuning on viola is harder because? Well, it's certainly harder than, than piano. Oh, yeah. I don't have to do anything. No, but, uh, no, but because it's large, don't you have to move further and like kind of grab things more? Do you mean relative to violin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well. Everything you is could, relative could... to violin. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> For, for those of you out there, La Viola, the viola, right? The, the original string instrument of the violin family. We call it the violin family, but it's the viola family. Il violino is the diminutive viola. Ino, la viola. Anyway, just saying. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, we, we have larger tolerances uh, than violin, but, you know, you just... You, you live with it. I don't know. It's a violin. And you celebrate the small. high fifths. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, that's great. Cool. Well, thank you. Um, so we're going to have you stay here while we add Dan Kellogg to talk about the inspiration. Um, yeah, that would be great. And that microphone. So Dan, um, tell us about the inspiration for this. Sure. If people don't know, I'm married to Singai, so she's been dealing with my notes for a long time. This was written probably 20 years ago for the violist Antoine Thomas Diet, and it was part of a three movement work where I based each movement on um, a piece of visual art that was inspired by a romantic lover, Eros. I remember the third movement was called Amorous Parade, which I thought was just a fabulous title. So Galatea, and I'm, I don't know, is it Galatea or Galatea? It's Galatea on Google, but Galatea. you can say Galatea because it sounds good. I like Galatea. <laughs> um, it is a, a modern artist's interpretation of the myth with a, a contemporary sculpture. And I think at the time I had recently spent some time at one of the um, artist retreat places like McDowell. And when I go to those places, I always make it a point to, to visit with different kinds of artists and learn about what they do. And I think it was around that time I'd come to understand a very simple concept but totally new to me was when you sculpt in stone or uh, wood you're removing things and the sculpture, the, the final result is emerging from this larger block, very different approach than if you're doing something with clay where you're adding or you're using clay to then make a mold and the idea of 
finding this idealized woman within this block of stone, I found to be very inspiring. And then this, um, I don't I want to say perverted, but this sort of off-kilter notion that the artist would then fall in love with the creation and would desire for that creation to come to life. So it, it didn't get more literal than that, but I found that to be a very sort of moving inspiration for what was the slow movement of the work. And so the, the basic sort of inspiration is that it's very sort of hollow and distant in the beginning and in the end, and then this thing emerges, and you have both these warm and lush tones built around triads and thirds and fifths, but then all of this dissonance that's worked in there. And I love the idea that a dissonance that's very close. Could you play a minor second and then a major seventh, the same one? That you have the exact same dissonance, but you expand the interval, and now it's a completely different thing. Um, there's something lovely that uh, Mitsumi said last night, where he said that a lot of music is based on stepwise motion. You know, the majority of music, and, and for me as a composer and as a former professor of composition, I love thinking about the syntax of notes and how the syntax of music is like the syntax of a language. And most of what we do is move by stepwise motion. And then when we have leaps, it's filled with bigger meaning and bigger structure. And so this has lots and lots of leaps. And it's a very much of an angular piece that goes up and down at the same time that it has lots of dissonant um, steps. So somehow all of that is playing into this abstract notion of a sculpture who is looking into this opaque bit of rock, seeing this idealized creature that then comes to life and then somehow recedes. Long answer. Yeah, that's great. So, you know, I, I was thinking about how I connect with that story as a performer, and I feel like it, I am trying to have a lot of patience as I am struggling to bring the piece to life. And then there's the other side of just waiting for it to reveal itself, waiting for it to happen. Um, so yeah, so, so your piece is the statue for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could say something about, um, they were talking earlier about rhythm. And this piece is notated in very straightforward rhythms, square meters, like four beats to a measure, three beats to a measure. But it really has nothing to do with bar lines. And it's, I, in many of my slow pieces, I view time as, as this thing that doesn't neatly fit into patterns or rhythms, um, almost like sort of the, the human speech has some rhythm to it, but it's not always so consistent or parsed out into little repeating patterns. But so much of music actually gets translated into little repeating patterns. So this, I can only imagine, is a very frustrating piece to begin to learn because rhythmically, it's very, very clear, it's all laid out, but nothing is intuitive about it. It has to be sort of absorbed over time and internalized. And then, of course, the goal is that you transcend the awkwardness of the notation to where it feels like it's almost an improvised utterance as opposed to something that some composer closed a door, sat in a room by themselves for a long time, and came up with it. Um, I mean, that would be the goal. So I think rhythmically it must be a challenge to get through all of the counting, all of the coordination and, and the choreography between the two to where then it feels natural. I don't know, Mitsumi, what was your experience with the rhythm? I, I think that that made sense. You know, it sort of looked like that to me, <laughs> like on the page, like, you know, there's, there's a lot of complication and then we have actually a lot of complication in unison in, in a few spots, right? Um, and to try to coordinate that, you know, like, why wouldn't you just put that on the beat? <laughs> why wouldn't you? Well, because it, it should probably feel organic and, you know, so I, I decided that, that it would probably be improvisatory, right? You know, yeah. so. You I, know, there's this, uh, there's this great improv exercise, we'll have to try sometime, that a friend of mine told me about where they sing a, um, a Bach chorale and everyone holds each note for three counts, three quarter notes. But because everyone counts differently in their mind, it becomes this like wash of sound and 
it sounds like a really fun game to do, but I think the challenge for us is like we we have to count internally the same way in order to land at the next spot <laughs> together uh, for those moments where we do have unison. And um, I didn't I didn't think it was awkward or frustrating or anything. I I just thought that it took um, some time for us to decide where we want to move forward and where we also want to play with dynamics. So playing with the dynamics today, I think, helped a lot with feeling it um, more securely. Um, and it's not always more dynamic. Sometimes less dynamics is better for feeling something more clearly. Yeah. You know, it's the second time I've heard it. It's a But I thought it was interesting that, especially in the first third and the very end, you're, you have these long sustained notes in one instrument that can do that, but then you're allowing the piano sound to just decay away. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you were thinking about that as you were composing. Oh, it's a, it's a great question. question about that there's long sustained notes in one instrument and then the other instrument is a percussive instrument where then the sound decays. Um, I, I, in slow movements, I actually tend sometimes in a piece like this to view the piano almost as a resonating chamber against which the solo line is, uh, is existing. So, you know, for, for instance, at the beginning, it starts with a G, and then there's this open fifth, which is fleshed out in the piano part, almost as if the overtones of that G is now being echoed in, in this beautiful instrument, um, where we have all these strings that resonate and create this dance with each other. And um, you know the, the piano is essentially a percussive instrument, and I think of it that way. Yeah, sorry, I'm, it's, it's a bit of a rambling answer, but it's a great question because it, uh, it it very much is the sounding box by which all of the harmonic inflections and nuances of the viola part are sort of either amplified or colored or distorted. I mean, we're so lucky to have Sujachi's piano here because it has such a great sustain. Uh, and I think, so Joshua, you're talking about 12 seconds. Is that the goal for the resonance? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's perfect for the length <laughs> of each chord to hold for that long. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, thinking back to our piano and tensor from last year, orchestral colors, I was thinking of little bells, uh, some, some of them, to think about how to make it last in a maximum capacity of resonance. So not necessarily like a physical presence, but more of like an ambiance, kind of an energy. It's just a pleasure to do it on this instrument because you, you do get that. Yeah, it's a beautiful instrument and yeah. the resonance is really built into the piano part. 12 seconds is a long time. I know. Right? I'm just sitting here like trying to count it out. It's like, wow, that's... Yeah, that's so Adrian and I did count time. it out once and oh, yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> Well, actually, your bow lasts a long time. That's amazing, right? How many seconds does your bow last? <laughs> I have never counted. <laughs> I've heard of people doing like, like there was like a Joseph Gingle, the violinist and pedagogue, did like a, a one minute bow. It was like kind of an exercise, but it wow. sounded like, <laughs> I think. Maybe I'm wrong, but oh, it's wow. like apocryphal. Oh, okay. the story. <laughs> like how specific? What quality of the string sound do you have in mind? Which one do you compose? Oh. Okay, so let me just repeat. airy, dense. Do you want to repeat the question? Yeah, the question is, um, it's a, our friend Luen, who's a, a wonderful violinist, and he's asking, when as a composer I write, do I have a very specific string sound in mind? And yes. Um, there's a lot of this piece that depends on open strings, which implies either there's zero vibrato or maybe there's a slight nuance of the instrument, but it's, it's a very sort of straight, pure tone. At the same time, it's a very, um, I, I'm always looking for not a breathy string sound, but sort of, even if it's very, very soft, I want real meat and roundness to the tone. Um, something I didn't say is, Part of what I love about the viola is uh, it really reflects the range of the human voice better than any other instrument. And so I find it, I, I love the cello, uh, I love the violin, but I, I find the viola to be the most expressive of the string instruments. 
And um, so for a piece about uh, three movements about romantic love, it just seemed... You got that on tape, right? You got that? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. I can equally praise any instrument and defend them all at the same time. I'm sure I'll say something else. Um, but I, I also, there's a very American um, tradition that I'm pulling from. Um, you know, Copeland and Barber, even though they probably had different string sounds in mind, there's a purity and elegance, a cleanness. Um, one of my teachers who had studied with Copeland talked about how clean his scores were. So you could, you could, hear, every, you, you could hear everything you saw on the score. Now with a piece for piano and viola, that's not such a big stretch, but there is a lot of leanness to the different parts of the score. And so I want a sound that is present but clean round but not um, too lush, not overly romantic, not overly vibratoed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what if your concept of clean and the performer's concept of clean and the audience's concept of clean, uh, they're totally different. Yeah. Uh, as a composer, how do you... Uh, Reconcile that. that yeah. yeah, so the question was, what if the, my concept of a clean sound versus the performer's versus the audience is very different? Um, I've long had the belief that as a composer, there's a point at which I hand the score over to the performer and the piece no longer is quite my own. I mean, that's, there's some grayness to that. I, I usually yearn for the first performance to be the closest I could get to my realization, but I go into that performance knowing that I'm going to learn things from the performer. They're going to teach me things about the piece which I didn't know. We're going to discover it together. But after that first performance, I, I, I'm happy, I like to have a great deal of openness to what the performer wants to bring to it. There are certainly times where somebody's approach might be really dead wrong, and I could indicate that. But even then, I try to have a lot of flexibility and can smile through a lot of different interpretations. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very happy to have people have different interpretations of the music. Dan is very collaborative. In, in it's work style. Except that I write very demanding music often. <laughs> Other than that, yes. <laughs> that's not so collaborative. And then you come in with a smile and you get away with it because you're so collaborative. <laughs> yeah, but it, I mean, it, I, I think that you're trying to get like a, I don't know, a grittiness in there. And that's, so it's not just writing things that are hard because you don't know how to write easy things. It's because you're trying to find a quality and express it. Yeah, I would also say that on the string writing, so I had the pleasure when I was like a high school student of playing all the string instruments except cello. So I played violin for 10 years, I played double bass, played viola for about four or five years. And so I can finger it all, and I know the, the sound of it, and I can, you know, I'm not good, but I can think through all of the different ways of playing on the different strings. And so there's a lot that's built into the way that it works that almost sort of lends to a certain sound. I mean, with so many open strings and then rubbing from the G to the F sharp and that dissonance, I mean, it, it sort of implies, I think, a certain sound. I mean, that's my, I think I've gotten those results most of the time. Well, should we bring in Sajachi to talk about the, the piano sound? Let's bring out the action so we can show you guys what is actually inside here. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sujatri, um, and I, I'm the owner of this place, and I'm a concert technician, we rebuild instruments, but we rebuild it to a very high level that it ends up in stages or recording studios. So we, in order to be able to do that, do that we have to use uh, engineering. You know, my story is about 200 years, of, <laughs> from 1700 to 1900, we skip this. Um, but it's very important to understand that uh, musicians want, want to get away from a harpsichord sound. And, and that was the birth of the forte piano in 1700. And everybody kept breaking them and not being happy. And uh, so Beethoven was one who was very influential in the new design, more modernizing the piano. Then, then it concluded with uh, Chopin and Liszt. And uh, the, the piano, at least always had three pianos on stage, backstage. He kept breaking them. And there was a goal uh, by piano makers who could build one that least cannot break. So <laughs> anyway, um, by let's say 1882, you, you have a, the modern concert ground was born. And it had not changed since, as nobody knows. Because there are new pianos coming out uh, from the, the store, from the showroom. 
but it's potential in an 1880 design. At the beginning, there, there were maybe about uh, six, 700 uh, moving parts in the, in the forte piano. And by the time they finished it, there, there are 12,000. And handmade. Yes, yeah. uh, yes, so yes. So a uh, lot the, of labor, a lot hours of, of labor. Yeah, it's, uh, normally it's about two, three years uh, to make a piano. Uh, I would like to take a little break here because none of, none of these will make much sense unless I try to make a parallel, including playing music and compositions and techniques. I was just thinking, how could I make it very quick? Um, I, I was thinking uh, uh, the word nature, we can use it in two ways. One, a concept, and, and the, the other one, it's manifestation. So the manifestation, all that we see, but potentially what, what is the, um, uh, the, the, the moving uh, energy and what, uh, is nature a concept. A pianist is always the same, a concept, but, but the pianist uh, inside wants to be m manifested in many different ways. And, and you could place many different compositions, exploration, still talking about the same what is inside you, and you, have not, you don't change. You just explore different possibilities. So this is a very important for all of us to understand that, that the only time we can be happy if we understand this phenomenon, which is the concept, which is nature, and out of that all the many complexity of life unfolds. And now, we, now here's a human body and everything we see around ourselves shows the complexity of a human body. Yeah. So if we get to music, and we had to do 12,000 parts because of the complexity of this mechanism, the, the body, and, and, and the variety of performances is because of the complex, co complexity of our psyche. I don't know this word very well, but you know, whatever inside that you would like to, to uh, uh, resonate with, and, and whatever inside, uh, re resonate, you would like to, to, uh, to communicate into the outside or to resonate. So, as a human being, we, we all want to do that. Either we speak or we do many things to, to do so. Imagine if you, 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 you come to me, you bang on the door and say, this is what I want, but I want it this way. So uh, then the engineer comes, so that's right. So then the engineer, engineer has to come up with a, a, an object that could uh, convey what's inside. And, and, and so I would have to uh, study with whom I am, who is placing the order, who is requesting. And for, so first of all, you have a, a, an anatomy, you have a human body. And the human body will correspond with the key, with this one. So the key is the extension of your hand, arm. And, and this has to be able to work with the same speed like your finger can move. So there's a certain number of 50 grams down and 30 up. When, when you mentioned that, what did you think for that melody? And nobody really thinks about it, but the brain can do both. The brain transforms sound waves into light. Uh, pictures, uh, but we communicate, actually we communicate with sound, but we ignore it and we enjoy the, the result, which is what did you see. Uh, but if the sound wave is not good enough, you will see nothing. You know, if you, you're just not going to do that game. So, okay, I just wanted, I hope it's somewhat clear, the significance of, of, of what musicians do is that they, they, they they take a leading position to go dive deep in and express what they see and hear and, and, and share. And so I think, did I go very far? That's great. <laughs> and and so, so for me, it's very important uh, to understand what's inside. Mm -hmm. And when people are asking, why was Stradivarius so great, maybe the Sherlock? No, he knew what was inside, because whatever he had inside, <laughs> is the same in everybody else. So he would scrape the wood until he was touched. Right? So 
so that's a Stradivarius. He knew what was inside, and he could not compromise because in the, in the face of what's inside, you cannot lie. You cannot compromise. So that's why I respect all the musicians because they are so that's, uh, eager and, and work so hard to, to uh, refine it and bring it out and share it with everybody because we don't have enough time to do so. And so that's why this is a very important uh, collaboration. And, and, and in order to, to resonate with what's inside of a human being, the instrument has to correspond. So uh, somebody asked me, because I create color in the, in the piano, and then they ask me, what is the, the greatest, what, what is the color that, would, that is the ideal? And I would say it's your mother's voice, because that's the one at birth, which is quite dramatic. Then the mother's voice is the one that is like, calm down, everything is fine. And it, it, it builds inside us so deep that we, we, we place all the other sound waves on that memory that is worthy to be alive. And what a performer do, they, they represent the, the unmoving nature. They show you the multiplicity of nature, you tune into it, but then they lead you back into the silence. And I didn't talk about piano, but I think that's, that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> no, you, you hang on to that. Ah, um, sorry. We have some piano hammers. Yeah, feel uh, we, free we to We used take to have one. tours sent out for, for children in schools, and, and then after the tour, they would walk on the street and they would hit each other. <laughs> so please, please don't do that. <laughs> Which doesn't make as beautiful a sound. Can you tell us what yeah. goes into that hammer and what yeah, makes now, it so beautiful? Yes. Um, there have been many attempts to try many different materials, leather and other materials, and wool was the one that was decided because the, the wool is resilient. It does this. So when, when you stretch the hammer, it becomes very firm, but potentially it is like this. Uh, and when the hammer does this, when it hits the string and it does this a little bit, then it gives you color and dynamics. If it, if it doesn't do that, then you have only the fundamental. So unfortunately the whole world, um, because of the, the large concert halls, you needed more power. A perfected piano is 1882 for 500 people, not 3,000. So in 1891, Carnegie Hall opened. So they took this poor piano that was made for 500, and still today it's in Carnegie Hall for 3,000 people. And so they had to harden the hammer, and they had to do many, many things to make the piano louder, but they then the, the lyrical quality is what the, the soft hammer can do was out the window. So now everywhere uh, the, the standard is bright sound and uh, fundamental and you have to use technique to try to squeeze out some color. So, so the idea of color, in te teachers are not teaching color, the idea of color is not taught because the pianos cannot do. And so why we are unique, we, we, we stayed with the color uh, we work on French pianos and so forth, so, so we, we kind of represent that uh, the lyrical sounding instrument. So all these yeah. pianos are from Europe, and then you redo the insides of them, yes. so you renew them, and then you customize it according to yes. what the player is wanting. Um, and then for concerts, for example, yesterday we tweaked a little bit of the lead off, yeah. so that I can play some really soft, really, really soft uh, notes for this repertoire. Um, and can you, can you show us what you did? So this one is a complex lever system that allows you to repeat. Uh, if you don't have this, then you have the key and the hammer. And every time you play the note, you have to wait uh, for the hammer to come back, very slow. And um, so this was uh, 1820, and, and, and the designer was Erard. He's a French piano maker and harp maker. And, and, and he came up with this innovation, and nobody could do, do a better one up to, to date, even on computers, 1820. And just to uh, put, uh, put some political perspective, Bösendorfer accepted this in uh, 1910. 
because they thought French cannot come up with good ideas. <laughs> so, so we had this terrible Viennese action, all of it, in 1910. And so repetition, then we have the shank. And we have the shank, and this is very, very crucial. You have only 50 gram here. That's not too much. All the energy, you have 50 gram energy to overcome the physical resistance of a piece of wood, the soundboard. So in order to do that, the lever has to be very precise, not to lose the 50 gram. So that's why. And then, and then when, when we, so finally the, your energy is uh, here in the hammer and the hammer is flying. So this is carrying your energy. Now, this last moment when we bring the hammer very close, it doesn't touch a string, it escapes before that. So it's a very crucial moment. If you, know, if you can think of a whip, you know the whip, you can follow the speed, but when you get to the last uh, moment, that's, and you hear that, that big sound, that's two times of the uh, speed of sound. At the very last moment, when the hammer comes here, it actually snaps. So the, the power, the force, the, the, I forget the word, but <laughs> uh, velocity, velocity. 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 Anyway, allows to transmit uh, all the energy into. Now we can, reg we can play with this based on the player, how far this hammer escapes from the string. And yesterday, and, and, and for sensitive players, before a concert, we always bring this uh, hammer very, very close to the string. There's a screw here that allows us to, to regulate. But it's a very, a very, uh, not too many people want because it, it, you can make mistakes. So the hammer, and then that's what uh, yes. we, we did yesterday and, and I last like week. Risk. Yeah, yeah, no, no. It's, <laughs> it's very much when you have a racing car, you maximize it, but then you, the next day you have to redo it because it's, uh, things can go wrong. Um, and here, here, what I told you that de the density of the hammer is very, very important mm -hmm. because um, if, the, if the hammer is hard, it hits the string and it will bounce back right away. So it, a, part of the energy is gone, but we, have, we don't have, we have limited energy. So we can't have the, the hammer go and come back and, and create a bright sun. When the side of the hammer is softened, uh, we create like a shock observer. So then when this hammer goes, it hits the string and the side goes like this for a millisecond. And that millisecond is enough that all the energy goes into the string, into the bridge, and that will start to move uh, sunward. That's the secret. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. And I think that when you're um, choosing a piano or when you're performing somewhere, it is so important to have a tech who can really listen with you. And yeah. because this is a collaboration, um, and when you hear what I'm talking about, you know exactly what can yeah. be done to make it happen. Yeah. Um, but you need someone who can really hear the difference. Yeah. Yes, he, uh, hear it and then translate it into engineering potentially. Right, right. It, because any of you, if you have time, maybe um, eight hours, I can tell you all the steps we do. And then you say, well, it's not difficult. <laughs> But you have to know the steps and willing to do the steps. That, that's all. Well, it's like doing a Julia Child's recipe, right? <laughs> you can buy the book, but like to actually do it well and then to actually want to eat what you cook. <laughs> no, but, you know, I, I, I had a young man who, uh, who bought a humble bee from me with the condition that he builds it. Oh, so wow. he did most of the work except for the soundboards, the dangerous one he didn't do. But How did it turn out? Great. I mean, you know, I was there, so. You were okay. <laughs> but it's wonderful, and and, yeah. and and I'm sure you know your instrument. No, you can fix the instrument if you need to, or you know your instrument. No, I, I'll never touch it. <laughs> I mean, I, I yeah. No, I mean, yeah. I, I I, I'm scared enough. to. T I'm scared to touch it. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's a big <laughs> problem that for the pianist, uh, uh, Leon Fleischer. He, because he toured in Latin America and there were no technicians, that they trained him in the factory. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, when, when he needed something, then he told me exactly what I was supposed to do. It's like, how do you know? Because uh, he did it, yeah. Yeah, so it's, well, it's possible to learn. It's, it right. doesn't bite. 
Well, but, yes. But, they, but, but there but, might be lawsuits. I don't know. No, no, but, but, but you know, the, the, what, what is very important, it just like you request so an engineering request, and the result was uh, acoustics and emotional. Mm -hmm. So it's very important for a pianist to actually know what, what, what is happening, because then, then you can control what is happening. Mm -hmm. In 200 years, uh, all the makers concluded what works. So, so, the, so the blueprint, the, the scale design, you know, all that stuff, the 88 key and, 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 the, and the cast iron frame, it's all the same. The, the, there are principal difference in, uh, let's say, the Europeans. They they um, they they kept they continued with the um, forte piano idea. The outside of the case is the same material like the soundboard, with the idea that the sound wave hitting the touching the, the case, and then, and then dissipate, dissipate, dissipating mm -hmm. uh, the the sound wave like a string instrument. That's a philosophy, and that, that's a Bösendorfer, Backstein, all the others. Now the Americans, they went into a very different direction, which is hardwood. So the Steinway facility is laminated hardwood. Con it's continuous one piece, but five layers of laminated. Very, very powerful. And here the idea, and you will be able to understand that when you throw a rock into a lake and there is a cliff, and you look at the, the wave, it will hit the, cl uh, the, the cliff, and it's not going to enter into it, and there is no energy loss. It will bounce back into the center. But if you have another, the other side of the, uh, it's sandy, then the, the waves don't come back. So if you have the, the soft case, the energy that was produced will, will go, will disappear. But in the hard, in the hard case, it is forced to go back, and you can imagine the complexity. And the, I just, uh, like if you want Brahms, that is uh, very much uh, f for this instrument where the energy is trapped and keeps uh, building up. So that's uh, that's a philosophical uh, difference. So so the Bösendorfer and the European instruments are very closer to a string instrument, not so complex in 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 overtones. Yeah, the Steinway. Um, yeah, came out with a, a wonderful design that is uh, there still today, allowing that those qualities to be. Uh, the only problem with Steinway as well is Carnegie Hall, because these 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 guys were engineered for 18, 1880 for 500 people. So. Yeah, the internal mechanism, all those pieces. Yes. In yes. It's a human anatomy. What you see here, this is how human body works for, for this purpose. So it's the same because it's the, the human body is the same. What is different when you say Bösendorfer or Steinway sound? I would like to give you an example. Let's say you have a beautiful piano that you like, and then I put Yamaha hammers on them. And then I, I would cover the name, but you would swear it's a Yamaha. So that means that the biggest difference between makers is that their hammer design. Some of them are narrow, uh, wider, dense, lighter. The wood that they use is mahogany, walnut, and birch, and so forth, maple, and the weight. So all this, uh, you know, like I, I, I talked to Fazioli that um, the Americans, they, they like overtones because you grew up with this Mason and Chickering and so on. You had lots of overtones and, and the New York Steinway is a kind of overtoned instrument. And the Europeans went for clarity, you know, all of them. So I told, I told Paolo, maybe use another hammer for the Americans because this is, uh, he, he, and he said that he wanted to uh, design a piano, an aristocratic piano. So that's what he did. And, uh, but he asked me to go to the factory, show him what I had in mind. But he stayed with the aristocratic sound. <laughs> Paolo as um, Paolo Fazioli. Oh, Paolo Fazioli. Yeah. I, I feel like in the last 20 years or so, there's been a real swing back towards actually not trying to project so much in general in, in classical bass performance. I mean, it's like maybe because of microphones and recording and, and all this, but I feel like there's, there's more of a, a desire and, and a request for 
for color, for nuance, for yeah. not just straight up, like, you know, cranking up absolute decibels. <laughs> you know, I, I give you a very simple example. If a fire truck goes by, you don't hear it. You don't hear it. In, I mean, you just block it out and you don't even think about it. But if a, a child is uh, whispering somewhere, it comes right in. So what is that? So that, that, that's why I said that there is nature and we are the manifestation of nature. And nothing can fool nature. Temporarily, you know, we, we do stuff and we fool ourselves for a, a year or two or ten or a hundred. But eventually, the, 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 the presence of, of, of what's coming out from your artist is not going anywhere. It's just, it's just waiting for you. When, when are you going to stop? So yes, going back to, to humanity, to the, to, the, to, the, to the human feelings and emotions is, is um, it, 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 it just necessary. We can go on a mental exp exploration but it doesn't lead anywhere because the, the, the beginning is nature. And what is nature? It, it, you know, it, you can be upset you, and you walk 15 minutes on the, on the shore. And then after you don't remember why you were, or that you, don't, you just don't remember. And all, all happened to you is the, 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 sound, the, the sound of the sound wave or the wind just impacted your biology. And, it, it, and that those sound waves did not c care about what how you felt, and what was your opinion of the world. It just, your, your cells were absorbing and, 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 and harmonizing without you know. And then at the end, oh, I feel great. So, but we, we, we could know this. We could know this, that we, we have a mental activity. That's why we are humans, and, uh, but we don't know how to use it. So we, we put it on the pedestal, and, and this poor mind is exploring the universe, which is infinite, while it forgot its source, which is, we can call it nature, unmoving nature. So if the mind would give a place for the, uh, this unmoving quality, it would be unbelievable, while it dominating. So now we have a problem. We don't know how to work with it. So thank God there are artists and philosophers and others who, 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 who calm the mind down or the, the waves, the sound of the waves, it, it, it calms the mind down, or it goes around it, and then we, we, we can stay sane until this kindergarten time of, of we getting used to that. We have a mind that the capacity is infinite, and, uh, and we, yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I just want to throw it out there that Sujatri and I did a, a YouTube as part of our, my residency here, um, talking more in depth about the colors of this piano and two other pianos and how to compare them and how to listen to the differences um, and the characteristics of each unique piano sound. So I invite you to go to the um, singaishu.com slash clavierhouse page. There are several videos um, and I think that that would be another way to explore some of what you bring to piano making, piano rebuilding. Um, and then also just to tie in the things that we're talking about today, uh, I mean, thank goodness for you guys, because you're doing the listening, and that's really important um, to what we're trying to do in, in connecting the ideas that, that Dan had mentally and creating that into some sort of a, a piece of paper that can be shared with us and then us Bring, bring two very different instruments, two very different sound worlds together to collaborate with um, a new kind of combination uh, involving all of this engineering. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then involving your ears because you and I collaborate with what is necessary to play super soft sounds. Um, and then it goes to you guys because it really has to communicate with what you're able to actually hear in this space, which is great. I, I love this intimacy and I love being able to not have to super project, but think more about the different colors that are coming out. I would like to, uh, I would like to mention something that the, you know, what, what an artist does and, and it, it comes from within their own 
the way they were born, and there is a constant eagerness of exploring the unknown. And they, they, you know, they, they spend the time and try to uh, learn different languages in music to, to be able to express themselves and, and then share. So we who do not spend, I don't, I'm not a musician, so I, d I don't have this much time to explore, to dedicate. So when we come to an, a performance, then what we actually see that, uh, that they, 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 they went to the end of the world to find and bring it back to us uh, that we do not have that time. And so, so it's very, very important for the audience to recognize that without uh, being religious, but it's, I actually don't know the, what it means, worship, I don't know this word, but something that, uh, that when there is something beyond me and I don't know how to get it, there is a certain quality in me, a humility, a, a receptivity, all you know, these qualities. So these are prerequisite for, for listeners and recognize that they came to receive. They didn't come to listen and be a judge. They, we all came to listen, to receive, and receive from those who, who took the time and, and bring it back. And so if there was this uh, receptivity in the audience, then, then the performance would be so much greater. And also when we go home, we, 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 we go home transformed, not entertained. That's the difference, transformed or entertained. Sorry. I <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. So on that note, let's play uh, again and see if you guys hear something more this time after all those ideas have percolated. Um, yeah. Where is your, st okay. Thank you. I'll take it.